Hello and welcome to A Blind Date with Knowledge, the podcast shining a spotlight on research in the Northeast. My name is Stephen Liggett and I'm joined today by Laura Brady. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Laura. We've both been uh, super excited to record this episode. We're sat in the National Horizon Centre, which is part of Teesside University, and we've just had an amazing discussion with Professor John Young. What an excellent discussion that just was. We spoke firstly about early detection diagnostics for chronic conditions, particularly in urology, and then moving on to to wearable devices and education. Um, In fact, such a great conversation that we will have have two parts of this episode. Yeah, so this podcast is going to be a special two-parter. John was so generous with his time, so enthusiastic about his research topics. So should we just get into it, Laura? Yes, let's go. Part one. Here we go. Hi, so Stephen and I are here today with Professor John Young. Hi, John. Morning. (laughs) Thanks for inviting us here. We're back in the National Horizon Centre in Teesside. We've found it okay this time. Just about. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So let's dive straight in, John. How did you come to be here? What, what's your motivation for kind of doing the work that you do? So I'm really kind of driven by patient benefit. Mm-hmm. I think perhaps a little bit more broadly, I think about the healthcare practitioners that I work with and some of the challenges that they face day in, day out to try to help patients. But the centre of it is the patient benefit. Mm-hmm. So throughout my entire life, I've wanted to benefit patients, you know, whether you've had a family member who's been unwell Mm -hmm. and has had mismanaged illness or perhaps has passed away, Um, or you've seen somebody struggle with long-term illness, I think it's it's difficult working biosciences and not being drawn to want to help people in that way. Mm -hmm. So I came to Teesside because they do translational research well, Mm -hmm. and I was at the stage in my career where I was working at a place that did fundamental research well. I just see so many opportunities I think if we can let, be led by the the needs of patients and the mm-hmm. needs of uh, the the needs rather of um, healthcare practitioners, and we frame our research to address those needs, mm-hmm. I think we can do a great deal. So that's that's one. Yeah, that um, seems like a natural um, draw. Like having those things define the aims and the and the goalposts, yeah. then you've got a sort of a clear direction to go in. Talking about sort of people living with long-term illness, what factors are important to sort of making sure that you detect these things early and, and kind of what um, what do you consider in, in the, the sort of diagnoses pathways? Okay, so that's a really difficult question. Okay, uh, so <laughs> sorry, that. I've just gone no, straight into no, like no, 50 yeah. in yeah. hard, okay. but, yeah. <laughs> So we had a lovely chat before we started. Yeah. Before we, I know um, you're more than no, capable. No, no. <laughs> so, so I think the, one of the challenges is that the healthcare system that we have and the way in which patients and carers, the way individuals see that healthcare system is reactive. So we become poorly and then we seek help. Mm-hmm. Now for lots of long-term conditions, I think symptoms can either be like non-existent or really so very mild as conditions progress. And of course, there's different stages as a disease or condition progresses. So there can be periods of sort of plateau where, you know, symptoms are quite manageable. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, and we, we know that the healthcare system is overburdened. So I think some of us wouldn't ever want to go to see a doctor or a healthcare practitioner because we think we're adding to the problem work being a yeah, bother. that's true. And then for people with jobs and care responsibilities, you know, they might just not prioritise their own health. In any case, whatever the reasons, whatever the barriers are, I think we still have a healthcare system which is quite reactive. I think that's the biggest barrier. Mm-hmm. So I think that actually if we want to improve health outcomes, we need to monitor sort of blood chemistry and other sort of biomarkers and things like this on a regular basis, we can detect changes. We need to have tools which can uh, detect some slight differences in someone's um, sort of physical behavior, Mm -hmm. maybe changes in how they speak or their posture, all these kind of tiny telltale signs. They're not 
markers of disease, mm -hmm. but they're markers at the very beginning of disease. And they're sort of differences from the norm of that person. That's right. Um, not, it's not, like you're saying, it's not uniform. It's not, it's a bit difficult to, to give a, a range, but it's yeah. differences in the norm. normal. That, that's right. And so I think some of the diagnostic criteria that are used by practitioners, these sort of flow charts that are um, part of guidelines, it is a sort of one size fits all. And now saying that, of course, there are different kind of pathways depending on ethnicity and age. Mm -hmm. But you're right. So every individual is individual. So what's different for them might not be on somebody's algorithm. And it's, it would be diff difficult for an advising group to produce an algorithm that fits everybody. Mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity for AI and things like that. But then, Very you know, for, for individuals, mm -hmm. I think it's important that we can recognize those changes but yeah. that requires it to be something that we're aware of i suppose if it's a difference in somebody's chemistry blood chemistry some chemical reactions that slightly change mm -hmm. it would be impossible for them to detect that unless there's a physical sign of that mm -hmm. you know blood in urine a tremor occurring um you know change in eyesight that sort of yeah. thing if it's something very obvious Exactly. So talk me through sort of how, once you've seen those things, how that translates into therapeutics, then maybe give an example of, of a pathway that you've sort of looked at. Okay. So the easiest place for me to talk about is in urology. Mm -hmm. So people will start to develop. <laughs> I think Laura, so just to be really clear, Laura and Stephen are playing bingo here. Basically. <laughs> and so they've got a list. And so when I say certain <laughs> few words, Laura looks at Stephen and Stephen wins something. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've, uh, we tend to try to do a, a little bit of research before we yeah. interview our guests. But no, it's just because that's very much something that we were hoping you would speak about. So we've okay, done brilliant. all right. <laughs> 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 I'm certainly worried that I'm part of a bingo game. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 I'm <laughs> joking. So, um, yeah, so, so, I mean, the easiest thing for me to talk about is urology. So my research has taken me in that direction and I, you know, I have got some experience of trying to create guidelines for patients and carers and this sort of thing. And it's, and it's difficult because there are lots of different symptoms that occur that result from different conditions and different diseases. But let's say somebody has... A symptom. So they let's say they have blood in their urine, right? So blood in the urine that can't be associated with menstruation should always be investigated. So you should go to your GP and say, I've got some blood in urine, and the GP should dip the urine mm -hmm. and with a sort of simple dipstick test mm -hmm. determine that there's blood in the urine. That might not even be necessary, but um, you know, for some people there's microscopic blood in the urine, mm -hmm. which would be positive on a test, but might not change the colour of the urine. Are you taking oh. me back to the times when I was in the microbiology lab and yeah. testing a lot of those <laughs> yeah. every day? Yeah, and it's important. So then when blood is detected, then a practitioner would want to do a series of tests to try to determine the underlying cause of that blood. They would be different tests for a man and a woman. And um, and so, you know, for, for a man, for example, it, it could be cause of urologic cancer, um, such as prostate cancer. And so one of the things that might happen is the practitioner might do a digital rectal exam to um, sort of determine whether the prostate is enlarged. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be enlarged for somebody to have prostate cancer. It could be still at a relatively small stage. And a number of other tests then might be uh, performed. So we might do some blood tests to look for cancer markers. Mm -hmm. But as part of this, I mean, I've gone a little bit too far ahead. Obviously, the practitioner would do a patient history for yeah. patient history. So they might try to ascertain whether there's any other explanation for that. So I like to cycle and do sport. I mean, you don't get that impression. <laughs> I'm just at that stage in my life where it doesn't make a difference. But, um, you know, if you if you run or you cycle and you kind of overdo it, you can put the kidneys under a bit of stress and, mm -hmm. and you can get a little bit of blood in the urine. Um, likewise, you can have a bit of a traumatic injury as well. So there's a uh, an anecdote about a rowing machine, which we'll not have for the okay, uh, okay. <laughs> the, the post the podcast, podcast. We'll yeah, yeah, the extras, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Right. okay, with some minor celebrity <laughs> on ITV3, yeah, that'd be excellent. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can, you know, you can obviously um, sort of injure yourself down there, just a minor injury, and and that can result in a bit of blood in your So the the patient history is an important part of, of all of this to try mm -hmm. to determine what subsequent tests need to be done. The key thing is for the practitioner to try to determine the underlying cause. And to rule out, because the problem with urology is there's so many different potential reasons why somebody has a particular symptom mm -hmm. that without a number of positive tests, 
yeah. what actually has to happen is we, we rule out things by, by exclusion. So it's not a, a particularly efficient way of doing things. Um, and it certainly takes a lot of time to determine the underlying cause. So if it is a, a type of cancer, then there's potentially some delays because yeah. of the lack of positive tests determine whether cancer is an explanation. Yeah, So because obviously that's where the early earlier the detection, the, the, exactly. the quicker you can sort of start the clinical management. That's and, right. Yeah, tackle yeah. that. So just before we jump into some of the questions that we might discuss how we start to detect that, the, the main reason we were hoping you would speak about that is, is that you, as you talked about trying to change the guidelines or maybe your yeah. patient pathways mm -hmm. and a, a big theme of the conversations that we've had over, over, over the past couple of years even has been trying to shift the, the lens onto early intervention and early yeah. detection. I, I guess just a question that we've asked for the people is how do you think you can do that? And, and do, uh, do you know of any barriers that might stop you changing kind of guidelines? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it is about change of behaviors. I think with urological conditions, there's this kind of dogma, uh, this ingrained belief that just like our hair turning gray, that it's inevitable part of aging that we will develop some symptoms, that that's just part of growing old. Yeah. That's wrong, yeah. right? So just to state that, that's totally wrong. And, um, you know, although these, although 70% of people aged 14 above have chronic bladder problems or chronic urinary symptoms, and we know that from a number of epidemiological studies, so it's irrespective of ethnicity or, or, or gender, oh, sorry, or, or sex, it's really common. But being common doesn't make it inevitable mm -hmm. and doesn't make it mm -hmm. that it can't be treated. It's just so I think there's accepted. Yeah. So there's so people start with some symptoms and they've got you know family members who've had symptoms and so they just and they they manage you know they're fine they have their product that they use and therefore you know they don't go to seek help. So th so that so there's that. And there are a number of other barriers. So there's a number of studies that have looked at barriers. People are embarrassed. People don't yeah. want to um, take the time of practitioners. People are worried about what the outcome could be. Uh, you know, yeah, all of this a lot of things, stuff. yeah. So they don't want to have another treatment. They don't want to be wearing pads. And they think that practitioner will prescribe pads and then wearing pads and stuff like this. They want to be in control. So so there's, there's those long-held beliefs. And the way that we're trying to address that is through you know, working directly with patients and carers to try to address those. Yeah. So I was commissioned in 2019 by a, uh, by Tenor, essentially to work on web content for them. And I've worked with them continuously since then, since then to um, provide kind of accessible, medically accurate medical content. Mm -hmm. And their goal is really to myth bust and also to direct patients and carers to appropriate services, whether they're healthcare services or support services, to make sure people get the support they need. Mm. So it's not just about diagnosis, it's also about management and making sure people are supported mm -hmm. during that time. Because we know from lots of studies that people with symptoms, their mental health massively declines. Yeah. They yeah. tend to become um, less socially uh, interactive. Mm, yeah. They don't go into town. If they go into town, they use toilet mapping apps. Yeah. If they have an accident, it massively affects their confidence, things like this, you know, mm. massively affects people's yeah. lives. Yeah, I guess that opens the door as well to then suffering from different conditions. Yeah, like, yeah. exactly. And so the second part, really, to address Stephen's question about kind of doing that. So so the first thing is to try to change people's behaviours mm -hmm. and to change the behaviours of patients and carers, really, to encourage people to seek help. So whenever they have a symptom, to recognize that symptom isn't normal and then go seek help. So like for Tenor's web pages, for example, and I'm not trying to promote those, <laughs> but um, for their web pages, they're not just about known conditions. There are web pages now about particular symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you would Google, I've got this symptom and you find some advice about that and then you know what to do. Um, yeah. You know, you, you go seek help because you, you read that that could be because of X, Y, and Z, which are, you know, not, which are benign and yeah. can be treated, but could be because of A, B, and C, which which are not benign and and, and should be prioritised or something. Yeah. So we try and flag to the reader that 
you know, there's particular action that should be taken mm -hmm. and should be prioritized. You know? So there's, there's that behavior change piece. But then the second part is to do with new products, new devices, maybe new algorithms that help mm -hmm. practitioners to come to the correct clinical outcome quicker yeah mm -hmm. and so and this is a huge conversation but you know there's a technique that is still gold standard for a number of different conditions and it's called neurodynamics and it's essentially measuring how the bladder responds to being filled with urine coming from the kidneys or filled with a saline that's given through a, a tube a catheter that goes into the bladder through the urethra so the bladder will naturally fill and what is happening during neurodynamics is um, the the performance or the, the behavior of the bladder is being assessed. So they're looking for changes in pressures. And we know that in some cases, the bladder will naturally contract uh, as it fills. Okay. And I say naturally, what I mean is really invol involuntarily. So mm -hmm. it's thought by many people that the bladder should just um, relax to accommodate a growing volume of urine. So you've both got drinks, um, your kidneys are filtering your blood and your blood is filling. So if I'm making you want like to wee. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, we're, yeah. yeah. we're just <laughs> transparent to John now. Yeah. 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 No. The coffee moving yeah. through. Yeah. 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 Take, the, take the glasses off. There you go. You so, um, so yeah, so your blood is filling with urine. Your, your, your blood is filling with urine and it should relax to accommodate that. Now, when we measure pressures in the bladder, we can see that in some cases there are these contractions. It's been given this term detrusor overactivity, and it's been deemed as being pathological and being like a, a biomarker of a condition called overactive bladder. But back in 2003 and subsequent studies since showed that there's no correlation whatsoever between overactive bladder and this hallmark, these pressures called detrusor overactivity. So overactive bladder is a condition it's characterized by needing to go to the bathroom urgently. That's the primary symptom, but also an increase in frequency avoiding. So you'd be going to the toilet more frequently during the day and waking up at night to, to pee. And then over time, um, most patients will develop incontinence as well. So four symptoms that can't be attributed to infection, metabolic disease like diabetes or any other condition. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of capture all for these symptoms. Mm -hmm. But it, it is relatively easy to define when it's quite well progressed so somebody who is waking frequently and dashing to the bathroom during the day and peeing quite frequently and doesn't have anything else it's really clear that that's overactive bladder mm. but at an early stage it's not mm. now in this region patients have to wait at least two years to have this diagnosis using this machine mm. now not only is that inaccurate as i've sort of monologued about but it's also expensive. So it costs more than a thousand pounds a time. It's invasive because two tubes need to be inserted, one into the urethra, into the bladder, a second either into the vagina or the rectum to cancel out abdominal pressures as you move around. And there's the risk of introducing infection as you stick these tubes in. Mm -hmm. um, even when good practice is followed, obviously you have bacteria on the you know the very entrance to your urethra that can't be cleaned with a swab and stuff so we introduce bacteria into the bladder unfortunately mm. um, and it's not indicated in adults with frailty so although the prevalence of overactive bladder is the highest in older adults in particular adults with frailty this test isn't used for them to to be able to diagnose so we and others are looking to develop tests that provide an earlier diagnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, full transparency, I think it's really important to declare conflicts of interest. So mm -hmm. we have a spin-out company that was incorporated in late March, and we've got a test that we've developed for overactive bladder. Oh, wow. And it, it's just like a pee on a stick test, yeah. and it can detect overactive bladder before a patient even has symptoms. Wow. So is that like a, a different, yeah. using an early biomarker? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So... I've kind of gone on for hours and it's now like a day later. <laughs> but I wanted to get to the point that I'll now try and summarize, which is yeah, as well as behavior change, we need new tests. 100%. And our tests need to have biomarkers for very early on, you know, pre-symptomatic ideally. Yep. And then what we can do is we can treat early. And we know from cancer, it's less well established for other conditions, but we know particularly well for cancer that early treatment has much more effective treatment much more effective outcomes yeah 
and it's inferred for other conditions. I think there are some neurodegenerative conditions where there's a good body of evidence. There's not a great body of evidence for urology, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately. It's not that there is, um, people have asked, but the evidence is inconclusive. People just really haven't asked that question from, the, you know, the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. But the, our um, kind of premise is that if we treat early, then we'll be a bit more effective. Yeah. And that comes from the first bit of work that I did was to try to understand why some people, their symptoms don't respond to the different medis medicines. Mm -hmm. So I got biopsy tissue from people with differing degrees of overactive bladder, mm -hmm. comparing people with relatively early stage, but not well managed to, to fairly late stage. So it was a study that began in 2010 and was funded by Age UK. And it was my first kind of big break. It was a research into aging fellowship, mm -hmm. a very sort of prestigious thing. I was very lucky to have. And um, I looked at these biopsies and I looked at what was going on inside the bladder. And basically as the disease progresses, the bladder becomes totally remodeled. So lots of fibrosis. So, um, you, you know, that means that the invasion of fibroblasts, these non, we think not particularly functional cells, replacing muscle cells, then lots more nerves and lots more blood vessels. And then the receptors upon which the drugs that we would take act. So certain muscarinic receptors on which acetylcholine acts, which are targeted by the drugs that are prescribed by the GPs, those are gone. So the drugs don't work because the bladder wow. becomes remodeled. Uh -huh. So that was evidence to me that we need to treat earlier. Wow, and that yeah. was the kind of catalyst to try to use the knowledge that we had got from that work to diagnose earlier. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, no one had looked at acetylcholine as a potential biomarker. Mm -hmm. We detect a range of different chemicals and it's all in the public domain. So we'll talk about that. this now. Yeah. But but one of them is acetylcholine because wow. we know that it's released by the bladder lining and we know that it goes into urine. And we've shown in a, a, an important paper in 2020 that it's a key biomarker for detecting overactive bladder in early stage. That's amazing. That's stuff, yeah. Sorry, that was a really long... No, that is... Uh, no, no. None of this will be in the exam either. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's just a, a fantastic story of having kind of an idea... And the time it takes to develop all of the the tests, generate the data, publishing papers. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's 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 a it, it can be quite a slog, I guess, mm. like from start to finish. But I, it, it, it's just really fascinating that that, that, that people like yourself are taking on these challenges that are required. Yeah. But yeah. It's great stuff. No, really exciting. So that was in sort of in respect to the new test, but you did mention that behavior change as well is a factor to consider here. So I wanted to ask you about the e-learning resources that you've got and kind of how that sort of tackles the behavioral side yeah. of chronic conditions. I think I think that behavior change is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think you can look at any problem from lots of different angles and we might come back to that later. But, you know, for patients and carers, we talked about having resources. And another thing that I did, but never really um, progressed it as far as I'd like, is just simple leaflets, you know, mm -hmm. posted through doors. You know, these symptoms are not normal. If you're suffering with these symptoms, go see help. Because I get early help. PSA. So yeah, yeah, he is. exactly. That that sort of thing. Yeah, just, just really sort of simple stuff. But for practitioners, I think there's quite a bit of work to do as well. And it's no disrespect to practitioners. It's just recognizing the fact that diagnosis in neurology is quite complex. It's quite challenging. It's very difficult to do from a single test. You know, so the number of tests that clinicians use is not just the neurodynamics test that I talk about. So yeah. But a single test isn't particularly useful. The guidelines say that certain tests have to be done twice, but they very rarely are because the resources aren't there. And so it's about educating practitioners about um you know what's treatable what's not and you know how how to do this so in a bit more detail so i was commissioned by health education england as part of a consortium that included imperial kings and um, an ahsn an academic health science network called wessex ahsn based on the south coast so we together were commissioned to produce um continuing professional development resource mm -hmm. for NHS England employees of like band two and above. So it's basically okay. everybody. Yeah. Um, and it's around continence management in adults with frailty. Mm -hmm. 
And essentially, just in a nutshell, the idea is that practitioners would want to try to cure somebody who has incontinence, who has you know, a number of different urological symptoms. But in a nutshell, um, the key thing is to speak to the patient, try to understand what they, what they want, what their outcomes want. Because in adults with frailty, uh, number one, there's often underlying causes that can easily be addressed. And number two, the patient often doesn't want to be cured. You often can't. But it, it, it can be that you can address something which is treatable. Okay. So something that we're really emphasizing a lot in recent funding applications and in conversations with different stakeholder groups like patients and things is identifying treatable traits. So, you know, when someone has a long-term illness, they've got lots of different symptoms, but when you speak to them and you understand what bothers them, mm -hmm. it's not what you would imagine. And practitioners would often assume, let's try and treat, you know, this key symptom of this condition. But when you speak to a, a patient, that's not what bothers yeah. them. What bothers them is something totally different, maybe a consequence of that symptom, yeah. or maybe something entirely different. And with patients with frailty, that have continence issues, it's often not about trying to cure them so they're entirely dry, which at that stage is often not possible, but it's about maybe helping them to have contained continence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, finding the right type of management of their symptoms so they can have, you know, quality of life, you know, quality of life. Yeah, it's really interesting, like looking at it from that angle, because like you're saying, for one patient, with with exactly sort of the same presentations that they could have totally different experiences of that because of the, the way they like to do their yeah. life. So we often talk about how the research needs to sort of reflect the needs of the patient and yeah. looking at it from, I guess, it's not the traditional way to look at it from, but it does ensure that like whatever, what, 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 where you're finding or where you're generating the data and generating that information can be personalised. Yeah. So the second part of the kind of, not training, but um, trying to change behaviours, is that we're just about to launch um, a, another type of CPD, another type of continu continuing professional development, but this time for the care home setting. All right. So just in terms of the background to this, so, you know, there are lots of different care homes around the UK. Um, so there's tens of thousands of different care homes of different sizes. Some are privately owned and, you know, like kind of five-star hotels. Others less so. Some are council owned and again, different sort of standards. And I think one of the challenges in the care home setting is that people that work there, it's often their first job. Yeah. Often they haven't got a medical education background um, and they haven't got the experience to, to call upon. Now, when you work with them, they're really, really passionate, but it's difficult for them to have the resource for the training. So without the medical education, without the hands-on experience, they're learning on the job, you know, and no discredit to them or to, to, to the service that they provide, which is fantastic. Then they have residents of those care homes who are multimorbid, who've got a number of different conditions, all of which make it difficult to treat and to, to manage those. And as a result of multimorbidity, they often have polypharmacy. They're on loads of different medications that produce side effects that interact with each other. And so I think it's an incredibly challenging clinical setting. Um, and you've got people trying to do that job, perhaps without the experience or the training that's required. Mm -hmm. So that some people have looked into this and we did some research. There's very little budget for training, very little time for training, particularly yeah. amongst the non-private, non-very good or very well-funded mm -hmm. care homes. So with all of that as a kind of back and off the back of the Health Education England project, I approached a funder that I work with really quite frequently called Rose Trees Trust. Mm -hmm. They're a medical charity based in London and they have patient benefit at the heart of what they do. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic group of people. Um, they have a number of different funding calls to help people get um, projects off the ground. So if anybody's listening who's a practitioner or a scientist that is driven by patient benefit, mm -hmm. really strongly suggest getting in contact with Rose Trees Trust Rose and understanding Trust. their different kind of funding calls and how that charity can help, not only with just funding, but help to get people in touch with Amazing. other people working in the same field. I got in contact with them and I said, look, I want to do something for the care home setting because we've done some work. We saw that there was a gap to provide training around continence management. 
and they were really supportive. Uh, long story, I got some funding and we then started to develop content, so just accessible, continuing professional development that can be accessed via a phone or a tablet. Somebody can just pick it up, they can do a bit, they can put that down, and then the next time they have a break or, or whatever, they can do a bit more. Yeah. So there's 14 modules all around the different aspects of continence management, and at the end of this, they get they get uh, a certificate, and it just the idea is just to try to give people the confidence uh, about what can easily be done to improve quality of life in residents who are suffering with continence issues because mm. often there's loads of really simple small things that can be done you know for example people who've got incontinence will be told or will think themselves that what they need to do is dehydrate themselves that actually their symptoms will resolve or be improved if they just drink less fluid right mm-hmm. it seems logical doesn't it but that's a bad idea yeah okay and so well, actually what needs to happen is they need to you know, drink the right fluids, you know, maybe avoid some things that might irritate the bladder. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they reduce their amount of fluid, particularly become dehydrated, then not only will they have UTIs more frequently, but they're much more likely to have falls mm-hmm. and they're more likely to then have fractures and then they're more likely to be bed bound where they're more likely to have further infections and potentially, potentially a cardiovascular event. Mm-hmm. So we want to avoid people dehydrating themselves, yeah. um, but there's a myth that that's what you should do, you know, and lots of people do that. And some practitioners advocate that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Wessex HSN several years ago did a hydration policy, a hydration call, trying to help people, particularly who are older with frailty, but other groups as well, to make sure they were well hydrated. Mm-hmm. At the moment when we're recording, it's like 18 degrees out there, despite it being mid-August, mm-hmm. and dehydration is not a massive issue. But were it to be warmer, it would be, particularly in older adults. Yeah, People don't necessarily enjoy having clear fluids, and if they have a caffeinated fluid, that might create some some issues if they've got um, you know an underlying condition. Yeah, but yeah. it's interesting you say that, that people think about dehydration because as soon as you said that I don't know much about this I'm, I'm enjoying hearing you speak and learning about this area but as soon as you said that sort of alarm bells went in my head your um, face made it look yeah like you. <laughs> um so yeah it really would go against sort of you know having everything your body needs to function yeah. properly for lots of other things you don't want to sort of start a chain reaction of causing yeah. other other issues to deal with and I think that's a problem in it in, in with urinary problems though they don't kill people i mean an infection can spread and mm-hmm. so somebody can have a kidney infection which can become serious or they can develop septicemia which certainly can kill but it's a it's a quality of life issue and it's also that somebody dashing into the bathroom frequently particularly at nine much more likely to fall and then we've discussed what the consequences yeah. of that are so it's it's actually that it results in other illnesses and some of which are linked to mortality. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for people who are suffering day in, day out, of which apparently 70% of all adults aged over 40, there's just this quality of life issue, you know, mm-hmm. that it affects every single aspect of their lives and therefore has a massive effect on mental health. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the issue, you know. Yeah. It shouldn't be that we just focus on things that kill people. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you think of, say hydration Mm -hmm. is you would think quite a kind of potentially of a bit of a quick win Mm -hmm. you know you you get people educated in health and care Mm -hmm. setting and you describe all of the the problems that can potentially be negated yeah just from having a patient that's hydrated there was a piece of work in pathology where I think it was about 80% of people that turn up for a blood test mm. are slightly dehydrated. Mm-hmm. So taking the blood is harder. The results aren't as accurate. Yeah. Or they get hemolyzed and so they have to come in, in into the clinic again. Mm-hmm. So the diagnosis mm-hmm. is, is delayed and you just think, it, 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 like you've so brilliantly spoke about, is, is, is the chance to educate patients and the carers and healthcare mm-hmm. staff could start to really transform yeah. like the patient experience. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, Stephen. Uh, there, there are others. I mean, there are, there are loads we can yeah. talk about all day, but like, you know, dipsticks. So we talked earlier and you were yeah. saying about how testing for samples in the pathology lab where you worked previously, yeah. Laura. You know, so it's still common practice to take urine and dip it with those dipsticks, right? But yeah. it's, 
it's still a, a frustration of mine. It's not well enough promoted that those dipsticks are actually pretty poor. Yeah. Mm. Um, so <laughs> yeah. so Stephen yeah. knows. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, so we're testing two chemicals, leucosite esterase and, and nitrite. And leucosite esterase, you know, a, a chemical that is produced by white blood cells, but you might not have white blood cells in your urine if you have an infection, particularly if it's an early stage infection. And then nitrite is a byproduct of urea metabolism but only by a small group of bacteria that cause infection. And so you can have other bacteria that cause an infection, but you dip the urine and it's, and it's negative. Yeah. And then in an, an adult who is older, so as we get older, it's much more likely that we have bacteria in our urine. So we can dip and get a positive outcome. And it's not that a patient has an infection, they just have bacteria in their urine, bacteria urea. That in itself isn't something that would be treated. It's not something to worry about. It's perfectly natural in most people. You know, so what we need to train um, certain practitioners to do is to look at the clinical symptoms. And if they're on their own, then they could be cause they could be because of a number of other conditions, you know, some infection, some other types of infections. And then so clinical symptoms plus the microbiology. And then together, that's what's used to make the diagnosis of a urinary tract infection and then treat with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. But it's been commonplace for you know, at least 20 years. Somebody will dip a urine, it's positive, and they get antibiotics. Or they dip the urine and it's negative, but a patient has a UTI, and then they're told that actually it's, yeah. it's, it's fine, you know, drink more water. Yeah, yeah that's another myth, right? Yeah. Drink, you've got a UTI, <laughs> drink more water. Just, yeah, just keep drinking. Yeah, what about the, cranberry juice? Do you want a yeah. myth bus? Yeah, us, nonsense, or? yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, there's, there's not a good body of evidence that cranberry juice is effective. Mm -hmm. There you go, there you have it. There's the and, bottom line yeah. from Professor Young. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be on the side of a bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a red bus. A red bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So that was part one of the Professor John Young episode. I thought the discussion around the clinical urology research was fantastic. What were your initial thoughts, Laura? Yeah, amazing. I mean, we could have sat and chatted all day, mm. but stay tuned for part two coming up.